Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us from around the world. I'm Joy, and I'd like to wish everyone a very auspicious Chijou Tuqian. Today, we are very honored to be celebrating Chijou Tuqian with Jigme Kenze Rinpoche. Jigme Kenze Rinpoche has played an important role from the inception of 84,000, translating the words of the Buddha. He was a key participant at the Beer Conference in 2009, during which the idea for 84,000 was born. And he continues to offer us his support in many ways. During the COVID-19 pandemic, he kindly offered to recite two sutras for our Sutra for Wellbeing series, which offered so much solace and support to people worldwide. You can find recordings of Rumich's recitation of the dedication fulfilling all aspirations and the dedication protecting all beings on the 84,000 website. On this auspicious occasion of Chedro Tuchen, which celebrates the Buddha's miracles, we are very fortunate to have Rumichi here to share insights on the topic of making aspirations. Before we invite Rumichi to start the teaching, let us all recite the aspiration prayer for 84,000 composed by Brahma Pushpa. An aspiration prayer for 84,000. As peace, harmony, sanity, and the well-being of this earth and its inhabitants are now so endangered, may there never be a time when the world's media, school textbooks, and daily conversations stop using words like generosity, patience, and loving kindness, and when the meaning of such words is lost. As we fear the darkest hour of this dark age, may there never be a time when words like impermanence, anitya, unsatisfactoriness, dukkha, selflessness, anatman, dependent arising, praditya samutpada, illusion, maya, and emptiness, shunyata, cease to exist and when their meaning is lost. May the endeavors of the translators and editors plant the seed of the Dharma in all directions. May the efforts of the patrons and administrators nurture and strengthen the shoot of the Dharma at all times. May the noble aspirations of this endeavor maintain <laughs> and propagate the precious Dharma far and wide. This prayer was composed by Brahma Pushpa in India, June, 2020. Thank you everyone for reciting the aspiration prayer together. Now, let us invite Rumuche to begin the teachings. So I would like to start by greeting everyone on this precious occasion of Chontul Tuchen, the miracle month where the Buddha manifested um, in all manifested miracles throughout uh, this these 15 days and today on the 15th is um, he manifested miracles and so for us it is a miracle that the Buddha's teachings are still uh, available to, to study, to read, and especially in all different languages, I hope and I pray one day that just as it is available in uh, uh, Tibetan, from which everyone at uh, 84,000 um, are mainly translating from. I hope, I pray that one day it is available in every language, including um, the languages um, of, I can't pronounce this name, this word, but the clicking language I have seen it um, a few times. I hope and I pray that it is available in every single language. And if it can be, then I think it would be really a miracle. 
Um, <clears throat> so first I would like to thank everyone at uh, 84,000 for continuing your um, courageous work because um, what is being done here is not something uh, insignificant. It is really the Buddha's words that are being uh, made available in one of the most widely spoken languages, English. And this is no um, small feat. So I'm sure that working on it is quite um, quite a challenge for many, but uh, I would like to thank you for doing this and really encourage you to continue because you're making an impact not only on a few people, but actually making uh, it have an impact on the language itself, the English language, so that many, many centuries in the future, uh, if this world is still here, then we will all, we will all have the opportunity um, to have participated in something so precious. I would also like to take um, this moment to thank every other um, translation that has been undertaken, um, not just 84,000, but um, all traditions, anything that the Buddha has taught that is being translated, the Buddha and the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas, the Mahasiddhas have taught, especially. Uh, um, very dear to us, Tinti Wongo's words are being translated, and I would like to thank everyone for participating in it, because Tinti Wongo for us is none other than the Buddha. In Tibet, um, um, many of my teachers would call him the second Buddha of Tibet. Of course, in many traditions, um, we um, hear about Second Buddha, but uh, I would like to also thank everyone who is working on translating into Ongpo's words. Um, thank them for doing this. So, so now my friends um, at uh, 84,000 asked me to talk about aspiration. And <clears throat> of course, aspiration is something so Asked. In fact, um, of course, I'm, I may be wrong, but I think that um, in terms of aspiration for us ordinary beings, most of the time, of course, I can't say about others, but in my case, my aspirations are simply self-centered, murky. And um, if I check what my aspirations are, most of the time, if I just sit and think, what is going on in my mind? I think most of the time it's just neutral almost indifferent. And that is not the aspiration that we're talking about here, that we're trying to talk about. Um, my teachers, like Yavjitin Zirinbache, Andrew Rinbache, Yavjitin Jor Rinbache, Yavjitin Jor Rinbache, and of course, um, so in Sajitajin Rinbache, and Yavjitin uh, Rinbache, on Sajitin Rinbache, and um, just to mention a few of them, whenever they used to teach, I remember when I was receiving teachings from Yavchinsa Rinpoche, 
whenever he used to teach. First couple of minutes of his teaching would be simply just to remind us of the aspiration, what we want to do, why we want to do. And what was quite um, memorable is that whether it's Yerchen Rinpoche, uh, any of our teachers, they used to mention a few different types of aspirations that are available to us. Not all of them are necessarily desired, but first one, as I was saying, they would let us know, they would tell us to check our motivation and then to make sure that our motivation is adapted to whatever it is that we are trying to uh, accomplish. So as someone following the Buddha's teachings um, and as someone who is following the Buddha's teaching in order to follow his example, then the first kind of aspiration that I talked about, the indifferent aspiration, or rather, it's not even an aspiration. It's sort of a lull in which we are, and then we, we do things. And if that, that kind, if that is the, the basis of our aspiration, even though I may think I'm doing something uh, to become uh, helpful to sentient beings, even if I'm thinking that, whether that is actually the case or not, is something that it is very important for us to check. Is that actually what I'm thinking of? Or am I just sitting there because I'm supposed to do something? For example, like right now, as I'm sitting here, and those of you who are listening, tuning into this channel, what is your aspiration? In the background of your mind, what is the theme that is operating in the background? Is it uh, a wish to become awakened? Is it a wish to bring all sentient beings to awakening? Is it a wish that we are able to have at least a not, uh, not a bad rebirth? Am I just simply wishing that um, I will be happy in this life? Or um, are we just simply wishing that this particular session will go without any what is it called? Any obstacles, difficulties? I'm sure this has happened um, in your mind. Those of you who are arranging this, probably sitting there wondering and hoping that we are all in a place where we have a, have a good um, internet and that there will be no glitches. Is that the motivation? Or are we just there numb because uh, we have had a hard time, difficult day to day. Now, which one is it that is inspiring our actions? So aspiration starts with that, to check what is actually going on in our mind, what is aspiring our conduct, our actions our thoughts, our emotions. So first, we need to be able to notice, observe. If it is the first one, it is not conducive 
to awakening. If it is the second one, that we would at least like this, um, this uh, session to go without difficulty, then our aspirations will take us that far. However long this session is going to be, meant to be, if it is half an hour, hour, hour and a half, then after that, our aspiration has expired. And this kind of as expire, expiry date is not like the food or the medication expiry date, which um, I was told isn't quite that exact. You can still take those medications a couple of years afterwards, or if that food is still valid for a few months afterwards. And also we, we see this kind of um, a use by date on water says best before something those are of course um, man-made as man-made expiry dates and of course yes our aspiration is also man-made by us but we have made it precisely and if we wish if we are sitting there wishing may this thing go well during this session then by the time we have finished and logged off that aspiration has expired and it is redundant. Um, it is not going to be functional. And then, as you know, if we are doing this, not just so during this time, but maybe so that we have a good uh, life, like, for example, that those of you and me included who are working with this um, maybe we're wishing that this will go well so that none of us feel disappointed that um, we didn't do it properly so if we're doing with that aspiration not to disappoint one of these facilitators including myself then again that is not the aspiration, an aspiration which is conducive to awakening, although uh, useful so that um, we will all um, be responsible and accountable, but that's about it. It will definitely not um, bring us to awakening. That aspiration or that foundation is not you know, what we're talking about here in terms of what the Buddha taught. And then even if it is a bit more than that, we are doing this so that we don't end up um, in some uh, unpleasant uh, life form in the future, whether it is um, in the animal realm, the lower realms or the higher realms, if we practice, if we do this practice, if we are thinking, I'm doing this Zoom session so that um, me and all sentient beings can have a better life in the future, that is great. Um, but at the same time, it is not going to bring us to awakening, to becoming like the Buddha, Lord Buddha, Shakyamuni. Because um, that particular action is not earmarked for that reason. So, again, even if that is not the case, that we actually want to be free from the cycle of existence, that we want to be free from the truth of suffering and truth of cause of suffering, and we actually think that. And we do it for that reason, not only so that the Zoom session works well, not only so that um, this, uh, our human life, the next couple of months or years will go well, not only so that we, are, we have a better rebirth. And even actually, even if we do this so that we are free from suffering and truth of suffering, you know, truth of suffering and truth of cause of suffering. 
that still doesn't precise why we're doing this in the sense that it does not precise awakening. So it is really like having a GPS. If you don't put the coordinates clearly, precisely, there is no way we are going to reach that place. So how precisely we set the GPS will have an effect on where we get to. So unless we have this wish to becoming able to bring all sentient beings to awakening, it is not possible to become awakened. So that aspiration is not going to make us awakened. So it is not conducive to awakening. So I would like to first ask every one of you to just check what it is your present aspiration, the purpose of spending this time together on this specifically powerful day. Are we going to perform a miracle and give rise to an aspiration similar to, or at least leaning towards the direction that made the Buddha Shakyamuni the Buddha? If we are able to do that, even if our aspiration may be slightly leaning towards that, then I think we can effectively say that this was a memorable miracle month. And today, Shuntul Tuchen, the miracle commemorating the Buddha's manifesting miracles, will have been one of the most memorable commemorations because we have given rise to the aspiration and altruistic aspiration in our mind, which is usually quite barren in terms of bodhicitta. Of course, when I'm saying here, we, I should probably say myself, of course, I cannot talk about others. But if I look at my mind, it is actually a miracle if once a day I'm able to have genuine bodhicitta, genuine wish to become awakened. Most of the time we are triggered by our insecurities, fear. Most of the time, that is, I think, our purpose, our aspiration. So I just wanted to make sure that <clears throat> um, in terms of aspiration, what we are aspiring to, is something in tune with what made the Buddha the Buddha. As you know, there are many, many uh, stories where the Buddha became uh, sorry, when, when the Buddha was a Bodhisattva, where he gave rise to bodhicitta, the wish to become awakened for the sake of all sentient beings, or rather the wish to bring all sentient beings to awaken. And here, in order for this aspiration to be um, effective, 
we need to know that the thought of sentient beings is indispensable. Thinking of sentient beings is indispensable because the main thing that is preventing us from becoming awakened is the sleep of sleep or the slumber of self-centeredness. And there's no other way of wake waking ourselves from that but other sentient beings other sentient beings the thought of them thinking of them draws us away from the slumber of self-centeredness from the cushiness of self-centeredness that is why the wish to become awakened rather wish to bring awakening to all sentient beings, or wish to bring sentient beings to awakening, that aspiration is indispensable. So thinking of all sentient beings is not just charity, and it is not just some kind of uh, uh, add-on optional thing. It is indispensable sentient beings are indispensable to becoming awakening. So that wish is what the Buddha as a Bodhisattva had. I think um, many of you would have um, heard this story of the Buddha when he was um, um, a bodhisattva. Actually, the story starts with when the Buddha was giving teachings in India. And then it is, I think, in the sutra, it says that suddenly in the audience, many bodhisattvas stood up and prostrated in a particular direction. And then <clears throat> Some bodhisattvas in the audience wanted the other members of the audience to understand what was happening. So they asked the Buddha, why is it, Lord Buddha, why is it that these bodhisattvas suddenly got up and looked in a different direction and prostrated while you were teaching here? He said that is because in that particular direction, there is one bodhisattva just became enlightened. That is why they're prostrated. And then they were curious. They were asked. They were very curious. And then again, um, they asked the Buddha, what does this Buddha look like? What is his place like? And there, the Buddha said, oh, this Buddha is... You know, very uh, tall, and his place is beautiful. There is no dust, no dirt. And then he said that the audience, the students, were all very studious, disciplined, patient, compassionate, and very diligent. And suddenly, Many in the audience started to wonder, well, how come you know, our Buddha is not so uh, I suppose they felt that the Buddha that their Buddha, our Buddha, was slightly inferior in terms of the description. And then they said, Well, how how come that is a, that is so? And the Buddha said, It is because of the aspirations. So then the Buddha told them what the aspirations were that he made so that these uh, people in the audience, the place was, um, was so 
I suppose, compared to the other with the uh, the with the Shakyamuni's place. Well, there is earth, there's stone, there's dust, there's dirt. And I suppose um, there were people who were vulnerable, weak. Um, I suppose nothing by comparison to these days in terms of discipline, but still compared to the other Buddha, they were not as disciplined. So the Buddha told them, this is all because of aspiration. And then he, he explained to them how it happened. And oh, let me just tell you just few descriptions of that Buddha's Buddha field. They are all loving, kind. They don't have a murky mind like we do. They're always in meditation. They have all you know, um, powerful um, ability to practice their paramitas. They have shamatha, vipassana, strong shamatha vipassana and are able to um, to um, to dispel all uh, power of the maras so in that place the buddha said there is no one engaging in non-virtuous actions. They don't have pain. They don't have strong negative emotions. There is also no um, smell, I suppose. Um, the people at that time in that particular Buddha field didn't have body odor. Imagine in the middle of the day when there's hundreds of thousands of people listening to the Buddha's teachings. I'm just wondering how it must have been all those people having to walk to the teaching place and sit in the sun sweating These people must have thought, how come our Buddha students have such body order, whereas these, this, new, this other Buddha who just became Buddha didn't have? So then the Buddha said, oh, listen, I will tell you how this particular Buddha field of mine came to be. Then he said, long time ago, there was this king, um, his name was Tsipki Muchu in Tibetan, uh, and a loose translation, it sounds like wheel rim or something like that. And that king had a minister whose name was Yamsu uh, Dul, ocean particle, and at that time, the son of the minister had become a Buddha. And so this Buddha uh, came to the city where his father was. And of course, when he came there, he wanted to host the Buddha. But the king, because of his, because he outranked, the minister king said that it is his privilege going to be his privilege to host the buddha so he hosted the buddha for a long time and it is said in the text that because of the buddha's blessings the king even though uh, he had his duties in the daytime looking after uh, his um, 
subjects in the court, etc. But in the evening, he would come and make offering. During the day, everyone else, the kings, uh, I suppose, other um, subjects would make offerings on behalf of the king. And then at night, the king himself would make offerings. And he would hold a lamp in his hands, two hands, one on top of his head, and then sit in front of the Buddha. He felt such joy that he did not feel tired. He would even stand on one foot and put lamps on his knee, on his shoulders, and sat there all night. But because of the Buddha's blessings, the king did not feel the slightest bit tired and slightest bit disturbed. So he, the king made um, offerings of flowers and clothes and food for a long time. And then when uh, the king's offering um, were coming to an end, the time that he had uh, decided to make an offering, then the minister went to the king and asked him, your majesty, what are you going to dedicate it for? And then the king thought. And then that time again, the minister said, please, I request you, I plead with you to dedicate your marriage so that you can become a Buddha. The king said, I am not going to dedicate it for that. I want to dedicate it, my marriage, so that my dominion will become vast, strong, and that uh, I will have um, divine God, God realm-like uh, power and wealth, etc. Because he said, I don't want to become a Buddha, I don't want to become a monk, because uh, the monks, if I was a monk, then he said that uh, people would not obey him. Whereas he said, as a king, people obey me. And also he said, I don't want to walk on, um, on bare earth. Uh, I want to walk. I want to be in my palace with no dirt, etc. So anyway, there's a long story I would like to ask you to search for this and then read it. Maybe you can inspire yourself. And then <clears throat> um, the king refused. Then again, the minister insisted, insisted. And the whole story goes that then he goes to the Buddha. The minister asks the king. And then the Buddha um, shows uh, uh, um, different um, qualities and then the king thinks of them and then he decides to think uh, for a week or so and during that time that he was thinking and he was meditating no one was to disturb so the minister was getting a bit um, impatient wanting to know so he checked and he checked and in his dreams he saw that the king really didn't want him dedicate his marriage um, or aspire to become a Buddha. And then after some um, negotiating, he negotiated with the king and told him, please, let us go to the Buddha. And will you agree to dedicate your marriage so that you can become awakened if you can choose your uh, Buddha field? Then the kings thought that that was a good idea. So then they went to the Buddha, and then the Buddha said, yes, that's possible, you can choose. So then the king made aspirations, saying, when I become a Buddha, I want my Buddha field to be like a palace with the ground to be precious stones, and then there will be uh, ponds and lakes and trees, and even the trees when wind blows through it, it will resound sweet melody, and even the birds will chirp in sweet, melodious Dharma words. And then that king would live 
very long and that in that palace, in that Buddha field, in that country or Buddha field, there will be no one with any kind of disabilities, bad health. They will live very, very long time and they will be very handsome, very beautiful. And they will all be very disciplined, very elegant, etc., etc., etc. Like many of the of the, the Buddha fields that are described. So the king made that aspiration. And then after that, there were many other uh, kings. It, in, in fact, it, I think there was uh, about a thousand kings and, prince, and princes, uh, etc. And many of them made similar aspirations. There was two who made aspirations to not become enlightened until all Sentient becomes enlightened, become enlightened. So then, after the, the turn of the, the the minister, the father, uh, he made offerings, and when he finished making his offerings, I don't know how long it was. I don't know a couple of weeks or months. I don't remember precisely. After that, then it was his turn to make aspirations. So he went in front of the Buddha. And he made aspirations. And it is said that he made 500 aspirations. And when he was there, he was first so overjoyed that all the other prince, princes, kings made aspirations to become awakened for all for these sentient beings. And then at the same time, in the text, it says that his heart was shaking like a leaf because he was so worried, so sad for the sentient beings who don't have the karma to be um, elegant, good looking, healthy, long, living long, good character. And this minister was in tears and then thinking sitting in front of the buddha he said for the sake of sentient beings that have yet um, to have a buddha to make aspirations for them but these sentient beings with bad character um, short life vulnerable health Poor, poverty stricken, and um, even if they are rich, never satisfied, who have jealousy, who have miserliness, who lack discipline, who lack um, concentration, who sorely lack wisdom, yet you know, they expect the result of all of them. For those sentient beings who have been neglected by most of these, but these um, kings and princes, I make the aspiration to be born at that time. Then the Buddha said to them, that is why my Buddha field is like this. Because of the merit of these sentient beings, which, which is us. Um, also, our outer world manifests in that way. So in a certain sense, I think we can feel quite good and lucky, fortunate that we have such defects compared to the other Buddha fields because of that, we have had the Buddha Shaitamuni make these aspirations as the minister um, ocean particle. And it is at that time also, many of the other bodhisattvas made aspirations saying, when you become you know, a bodhisattva in your future lives, may we be there to inspire you to practice the six parameters. May we be there at that time 
to make you practice generosity, make you practice patience, make you practice um, discipline, make you practice concentration. So all these bodhisattvas made those aspirations. And thanks to those bodhisattvas, we have the Buddha Shakyamuni, and he made these aspirations for us. So the aspirations of these bodhisattvas is what is making us at this moment have this privilege, this honor to be um, fortunate enough to follow the Buddha. It, so in a certain sense, the aspirations of the Buddha has made this possible. But at the same time, aspirations have to be accompanied with some um, some practice in discipline. For example, when the minister, Ocean Particle, made that aspiration, from that moment on, he practiced the six parameters, practice of generosity. As a bodhisattva, the Buddha gave away his body, his wealth, as you can read, and I'm sure you are all um, aware of this, like he walked on blades and embers just to receive four line teachings to benefit sentient beings, to be able to give the gift of teachings, to be able to give wealth to sentient beings. Those are so important for these aspirations to be accomplished. It is really important that we know that aspirations aren't just wishful thinking. Like I might sit here and think, I wish I could go to the moon. If I don't put things in action to get to the moon, then I'm not going to get there. I will need the discipline of possibly learning um, rocket science and gain enough um, wealth to build a rocket, then that aspiration to go to the moon by applying the practice, the discipline of putting together what is necessary to get there is going to happen. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. So discipline is important. And then cleansing our obscurations, our karmic obscurations, or rather removing um, what prevents me from getting to the moon is also important. And all of this should be done um, with some uh, honesty, with some um, integrity, for example, you can't, I can't just pretend to do things to get to the moon. If I don't do it, then I won't get to the moon. And in order for that to happen, then I need to engage in positive actions. That is what the Buddha did as a bodhisattva. And that is what made the Buddha a Buddha. So aspirations isn't just simply sitting here and thinking, I wish I could get that done. In fact, in one sitting, if we can think of it properly, if we give rise to this aspiration, if we can um, arrange this mindset properly, which aspiration requires, so that there is discipline, there is cleansing of obscuration, and that we do it genuinely, and that in that process, we're 
actually engaging in virtuous actions, then just this one thought giving rise to this aspiration can um, have that result. So in brief, we need to make sure that the aspiration is followed by everything that is necessary for us to take us to what we are aspiring for. So what that means is that when we have that aspirations, aspiration, we need to make sure that anything that is not compatible with it is noticed. And what do we do when we notice it? When we notice it, then we need to be able to be realistic. At this moment, if I sit here and think, I wish to become awakened for all sentient beings. Some of you, for some of you, it may feel genuine. For some of us, it will feel just like a word that we would like it to be genuine but we are lacking the feeling of the genuine um, aspiration. In brief, there's a fantasy and there's a reality in our aspiration. We need to be able to distinguish those two. And if we notice that we're fantasizing about an aspiration, but that our reality does not catch up to that fantasy of aspiration. If you notice that, I was told that it is important not to feel disappointed. In fact, we should feel great that we have finally found out how to give rise to aspiration. Because aspiring is also a training that we need to develop. So when we notice our habits of uh, insecurity, our habits of annoyance, irritation. When we make aspirations for all sentient beings, as you know, sentient beings don't quite do what we want them to do. As long as sentient beings would could stay in their place, not in my way, then I can make aspirations, then maybe it'll work. But as you know, sentient beings will not uh, suddenly become um, amenable to our aspiration. And usually, that is a problem for us. When we think, I wish to become bring, able to bring awakening to all sentient beings. You know that with it starts with those who are closest to us, whether it is your parents, your children, your friends, your husband, your wife, your partner. We all go there with this wishful thinking. You might, for example, buy them a present and expect for them to feel happy because you gave them that present. Sometimes they are sensitive enough to act happy, sometimes not. And when they are not, it's so annoying. We might think, next time, I'm not going to buy this person this present. And that happens when we're doing our practices. And when that does, I think we should feel good about it, that we noticed what is happening. And then we have the blueprint of what aspiration should be and what it shouldn't be. And if, it, if what shouldn't be there arises, is actually a good thing to notice it. In fact, I think we should actually celebrate thinking, wow, today I realized 
that I wanted to make this aspiration. And I now know what it feels to make an aspiration. So that now I can actually make an aspiration. And even if it is not pleasant, it's not such a big deal. Because I'm not making it to feel pleasant. If that is what we're wanting to feel, then go to a cafe. Get a massage. That's easier. So don't expect when you make an aspiration to feel like you've been given a massage. Don't expect your body to feel all oily and, what do you call it, refreshed, like relaxed after going to a sauna. Aspiration is not for that. So it's really important that when we're making aspirations, that we don't mistake fantasy or reality for reality or rea reality for fantasy. And also we don't mistake um, aspiration for aspiration to be an antidote to the result of our past actions for each of the things that we are experiencing. Every single thing has a cause and effect, cause and condition, and we need to be able to find them. So that's more or less what I can think in terms of aspiration. So maybe we can have a short break now. And uh, if anybody wants to ask questions, um, I will try to respond to your questions. How about five minutes or three minutes? Um, what is it called? A bathroom break? That sounds good, Munche. We'll see everyone back in five minutes. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello, welcome back, everybody. Um, we have received a lot of really great questions from the audience from Vichy, so maybe I will begin with some of them. So there were, there were a whole bunch of questions related to developing genuine bodhicitta. So for example, we have a question from Carlos Marcondes, who asks, um, when establishing my aspiration, I often feel like I'm just thinking about it intellectually, nothing else. Could you elaborate more on how to make this intellectual aspiration gain that magical element of bodhicitta? Um, and just along the same lines, we had a question from um, Aditi Shik, um, who says that, you know, my question regarding aspiration to have the thought to awaken all sentient beings, but I kind of feel ingenuine, ungenuine while doing this because I haven't experienced or tasted awakening myself. So I'm just not sure how I can genuinely wish it for others. So um, that's the first question. <clears throat> okay. Um, so the link between those two questions is that it doesn't feel genuine. Right. Okay. The feeling that it isn't genuine um, that is a genuine feeling. And both of you seem to be saying that you would like it to, to evolve to a genuine feeling. So can you relate to that? That it is, you genuinely would like your ungenuine aspiration to become genuine. That is the beginning of it. <laughs> So I would suggest that first you really appreciate the genuine wish to have genuine bodhicitta. <clears throat> so 
that is why I was starting with the idea of indifference. No, when we start off, <clears throat> for example, if I ask uh, some of you, um, how would you, you know, how would we say bodhicitta in the clicking language? You'd feel blank. <clears throat> You have no idea how to, how to say bodhicitta. Well, that's more or less sort of indifferent, neutral mindset. And from that, we need to <clears throat> be able to evolve to full bodhicitta. So, um, <clears throat> Whatever it is that we're doing, it is so important that we appreciate or connect with something as, um, I suppose, tangible as possible. I don't know if... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, the two people who are asked this, asking this question uh, understand what I mean. And so once you start with that, if you can notice that you genuinely would like to be able to evolve to a genuine bodhicitta, <clears throat> that is already building the foundation for bodhicitta. You know, when you start off building a house, um, it doesn't just suddenly, when you decide saying, okay, this is where I want to build my house. You won't suddenly have a beautiful house in which you can sleep in, eat in, um, stay in, it takes the nitty gritty part of finding the money, buying it, paying the tax, and then um, building, finding contractors. And most of the time, you know, you're not sure whether this contractor is uh, honest or not, because you have heard so many times that these contractors take the money and you end up with nothing. And even if you have a house, what happens is that now you have to have somebody decorating it, putting the plumbing in electricity. Are you going to get, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, an honest one? Or are you going to end up uh, redoing your plumbing three or four or five times? I've had friends who bought houses who <clears throat> at the end realized that their house is full of, what is it called, mold, and they've had to rebuild the whole thing, and they've had to mortgage everything. Bodhicitta is no different because these shady business people are nothing but our habitual patterns. Our mind acts like that. So this is actually the reality of developing bodhicitta. If you're feeling that, how difficult it is, then actually you're doing the right thing. And then if you need more um, um, explanation on it, then I suggest that you read the, word, the way of the bodhisattva, how Shantideva uh, tells us about the, the advantages, the qualities of bodhicitta and what it is. And now when we're thinking, uh, we don't know what awakening is. If it is difficult to know what is awakening, at least first try to connect with cessation, what truth of cessation is. And then slowly from that, develop an understanding of what Buddhahood is. In terms of what Buddhahood is, try to see if you can understand what um, the definition of awakening is, what Buddha is, uh, like in terms of the Buddha, there is the 
um, two kayas or the four kayas or five kayas. And then in terms of the wisdom, the five wisdoms, what they are, and then it will give us an idea of what uh, awakening is. But in terms of truth of cessation, for example, as a Buddhist, somebody following the Buddhist teachings, we need to know that all of the Buddha's teachings can be uh, understood through the framework of the Four Noble Truths. What are the, the Four Noble Truths? Truth of uh, suffering, truth of cause of suffering, truth of path, and truth of cessation. At least if we can understand what truth of suffering is, often when we think of truth of suffering, we mistake truth of suffering for just one of the three sufferings, suffering upon suffering. For many of us, the second suffering is happiness. Most of the time we are making aspiration, may I have, uh, what is it called, suffering of change. May all of us have suffering of change. May my child have suffering of change. May my parents have suffering of change. May I have suffering of change. I think we have to first understand what truth of suffering is. Even if it is not suffering of change, even if it's a third one, even that is still impermanent. Therefore, it could turn into suffering of change, suffering of suffering. So first we need to understand that. And then we need to understand what brings that about, you know, bring the truth of suffering about in us. For example, when you think of truth of suffering, don't think of some kind of generic truth of suffering far away, but think in terms of your own experience. Like at this moment, we might be experiencing the tr truth of suffering of not knowing how to develop genuine bodhicitta. That is truth of suffering. So what is the cause of it? Ignorance. And along with it, while we're trying to develop uh, the ability to remove that ignorance, we are <clears throat> disturbed by um, the desire to have something pleasant and the desire to not have something unpleasant. So these two are disturbing it. So these two are the cause of that particular truth of suffering. Or you might be uh, suffering because you don't know uh, where you're going to get your plumber from. Again, just check in there which one of the tr uh, truth of cause of suffering is operating. And if you notice that, and slowly if you start to reduce the truth of cause of suffering and through which the truth of suffering will be reduced, then we have an idea of what truth of cessation could be. And in that process, we have already embarked on the truth of the path. So I hope this answers your question. Thank you, Ramuche, for that very profound um, response to those questions. And, I, and the analogy to building a house was just wonderful. Um, and I think that's actually a good segue to the next question. Um, the next question is kind of about um, how to reconcile the different types of aspirations that we see in different prayer texts. So um, this participant uh, just um, named themselves M.A., the initials M.A., and they ask, could Rumbachev please comment on the fact that so many texts say that if we practice this sadhana or recite this prayer, etc., we will be reborn in a good family or with good looks, have wealth, etc. Um, though all these material things are helpful on the path, this seems contradictory to the supreme motivation that Rinpoche has talked about. Sometimes I feel like I'm just reading a sales pitch. Well, it is a sales pitch because we need to buy into becoming awakened. So if, um, you know, good family, good health, good looking, None of them hurt. In fact, they make it easier. <clears throat> so that's why those aspirations are made. 
for example, if we make an aspiration saying, you know, may I be in my next life, ugly, poor, unable to, to, to do anything, make everyone else's life miserable, that doesn't help. So these aspirations that many, many bodhisattvas and our great teachers have made, they make these aspirations because they have first-hand experience on how to do things. For example, if we, if we were to fly to some city, are we going to make aspirations thinking, may the seat on the plane be uncomfortable, may it break, may the, the, the ear thing not work, may the hostess be annoying to me? That would be just torture. So if we make aspirations, all of these aspirations that are made in so many different prayers are in order to help us reach awakening because until we are fully awakened we are vulnerable to all these obstacles so these aspirations are made knowing the kind of um, obstacles that we will meet and so that these obstacles won't be there so these aspirations prayers of aspirations are not redundant they are actually very fine-tuned, very advanced aspirations that are made so that there is less obstacles in the path. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. The next question that we have is related to the type of lifestyle that we should aspire to. So an anonymous attendee asks, Rumiche, if the causes and conditions arise, should we aspire to leave worldly, worldly life behind and practice in a secluded place like the great sittas? Or is it better to remain in the world and use our relationships as support for practice? I think um, we should make aspirations that whatever will take us to the state where place where we can bring sentient beings to awakening, may that happen. I think the other two questions are um, irrelevant. <laughs> so Thank whichever you. works, whichever works for us, if we are asking that, if we're worried about that, then I think, no, don't leave things behind because we're not ready to. Mm. If we are ready to, this is something that's really important to understand. You know, often we think of renunciation being something so important that we have to renounce something pleasant. As long as we think that we have to renounce something pleasant, something that is good, helpful, and we do that, I would question the the mental state of the person who was doing that. Because, you know, as somebody who really wants to become awakened, somebody like Milarepa, like all our teachers, they left behind things because they knew what these things were. So as long as you are so attracted to something, like, let us say, this piece of paper, and I still think this is a really valuable thing. If I let go of it, I'll be constantly looking at it, looking at it, and then during that time, I'm not looking at the camera, and then we're not going to fulfill whatever we're trying to do. So this thing, as long as it is valuable to us, and we think I should let go of this, I think maybe we need to re revisit the understanding of renunciation. As long as we are renouncing something valuable, useful, good, then um, I think we haven't really got it. But now this one, this one I can throw 
especially if this is soiled by my snot or things, I will not feel any attraction to it. Renouncing that is really the healthy renunciation. Mm. Thank you. The next question we have um, is a more fun one. Um, Natalia Izzard asks um, Rimache if you have a quote unquote favorite aspiration prayer, um, or maybe one that you would encourage us to all of us to recite. For example, is it would it be the King of Aspiration prayers? Would it be entering the city of omniscience by Jingmei Lingba? Um, what what is your personal favorite aspiration? Oh, of course, Th those two are, you know, beautiful, great. I also like the aspiration prayer that Guru Rinpoche made. Um, I think uh, in Tibetan it starts with Chojo Tushi. Um, I don't really remember the name in English. Sometimes we call him Malam Yushalma. And there's many prayers. There's also some aspirations made by Yeshe Swagyal. It starts with Mahan Guru Um <clears throat> I think if we are used to making aspirations, then these are really, really great aspirations. And then, of course, if we can look into the, uh, if you have the ability, then read the aspirations of our own teachers, starting with all the way to our own uh, present teachers, then we will have really many uh, prayers of aspirations. But there's some, one of them is a very short one by Shanti Deva. As long as space endures, as long as there are sentient beings, may I be there to serve them. This is short. So at least with this one, we can't really think, you know, this is not the right time. I don't have the time to do it, etc. It is just there. Or, may Bodhisattva. Um, precious, etc. Those are, I think, um, more practical for us, especially we're in a in a time where we feel we are so busy. Although I don't think that any of us are too busy to read the prayer of aspiration, because at the most it must take what a quarter of an hour. But anyway, we are too busy even to have a quarter of an hour. So I think we need to be practical. We need to know what kind of person we are and what kind of aspiration we can do and we cannot not do, at least because we don't have time. And even if we, if we can't do any of them, at least it will reveal us who we are and we can be more honest thinking, all right, I really want to make aspirations, but I'm incapable of doing it. At least it will make us honest. So if four line prayer aspiration we can't do, then at least just make up one line prayer that you can relate to. You can't say, oh, this is, you know, prayers done, made in the past century. It is not in tune with what I'm feeling. And even if that is not it, just have the wish that sentient beings, the obstacle to all sentient beings awakening, our self-centeredness will be, you know, lessened. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. And we received several questions asking Ramucha to elaborate on something you said at the very end of the talk um, about mistaking aspiration for the search for antidotes to pass action or pass mm -hmm. karma. Could you just elaborate a bit more on that? Um, that is just to say that, you know, sometimes when, whether it is aspiration or any practice we do, most of the time we do it because, you know, we want to um, escape something. We want to not uh, feel something. And most of the time when we do it in that way, I think that very often, we are relating to our aspirations and prayers in a way that is a bit like a, a numbing agent. That is what I meant. 
for example, sometimes we might feel uh, upset, annoyed, worried, and then we make aspirations. But at that time, are we ma genuinely making aspirations? Or are we just trying to make ourselves feel good? That's what I meant. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with making ourselves feel good. If you recognize that, if you notice that, then maybe we can attempt to make a genuine, as genuine an aspiration as we can. Please don't worry about non-genuine aspiration, whatever aspiration we can muster up. Slowly, it will become genuine. We will not suddenly become genuine. Even if, you know, even if it will take, we need a courage that makes us feel that even if it takes me, you know, 10 years to make a genuine aspiration, I will do it. And even if it will take me my whole life to make a genuine aspiration, I will do it. And even if it takes me a hundred lifetimes to make a genuine aspiration, I will do it. That is how I think the bodhisattvas of the past were able to upgrade their aspirations because they did not give their aspirations a time limit. They just wanted to have the, the ability to awaken all sentient beings. And that was it. They didn't say, as long as things are comfortable, as long as I don't have to, you know, feel uncomfortable, wake up early in the morning, go to sleep late at night, and, you know, miss some dates and some of my, what is it called, flicking right or left on the Tinder date. <laughs> As long as I don't have to do any of them, then I will give, you know, give rise to bodhicitta. As long as there's none of those, what do you call it, conditional things, but that we just want to become able to bring all sentient beings to awakening. How long it takes, how difficult it is, is actually irrelevant. So it's not a race. We're not trying to compete with someone. We're just trying to sow the seed of awakening and then we're just trying to nurture that seed by watering it by protecting it from weeds by protecting it from other things that will disturb it we really need to see our aspiration like a seedling or like becoming pregnant just like a mother who is pregnant will take all precautions to give birth to the child. And also, um, whether it is you know, um, how long it takes, how difficult it is, the parents, you know, the mothers, usually um, do not think to them, I'm going to take care of this child until this child is old, 10 years old, etc. I know of mothers who have who are 80 years old, who have children of 60 years old and still taking care of them. There is no time limit to it. And this is how it should be with our aspiration. So please don't be in a hurry to have a good aspiration quickly because sometimes this sabotages it. Thank you so much. And with that last last question, we will bring our event today to a close. Rumichit, thank you so much for taking the time on this auspicious day to share your wisdom with us. May we all endeavor to make and maintain our aspirations as you have taught us today. And to all of our participants, please stay tuned for the events that 84,000 will be organizing for the remaining 210 days this year. And be sure to sign up for our newsletter to be up to date with the latest updates. Thank you. Thank you to everyone for joining us. Take care and see you all next time. Thank you, Muche. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.